Hello, my name is Christine Dwyer Hickey and I'm here today with you as a guest for, uh, of Alliance Francaise Facebook Live series. As a former student of Alliance and as a, a frequent guest in the um, Franco-Irish Festival, I'm really delighted to be, to be here. And I'd like to read today an extract from my latest novel, The Narrow Land, but first maybe I'll tell you a little bit about it. It's um, set in Cape Cod, a remote part of Cape Cod in 1950, and it deals mainly with the um, American artist Edward Hopper and his wife Jo and their troubled marriage. And it also is about uh, a friendship they forge that particular summer with um, two 10 year old boys, one of whom is a German refugee who has been um, adopted into America after the war and the other is um, the son of a fallen American hero. And this section I've picked here deals with Edward Hopper. It's a very quiet section and it's about reading. I thought you might like it because I'm sure a lot of you are into reading. And uh, so sit back and relax and close your eyes and if you fall asleep, nobody will say a word to you. He gets up early to read. Most mornings he manages an hour or so before his wife begins to stir. If she's still sleeping when the hour is done, he may attempt to work. If it happens to be one of those days when the studio seems more like a place of incarceration, he will put down his book, close the door behind him and go out for a walk. When he reads, he opens back the Dutch door to let in the morning air. He sits into his chair, puts his feet up on the chaise long, keeps the coffee pot close to hand. Then he opens his book. And he is a fly on the wall at someone else's party. It's for the same reason he has always enjoyed going to the movies. His wife usually starts talking as soon as she stirs. He hopes today won't be one of those days. Sometimes she will start even before she opens her eyes. She may say something like, How's the weather doing out there? Or, You know I had the strangest dream last night? For the past few days, the first words out of her mouth have been in the form of a question. The same question. Do you think we might get any news from New York today? He will usually respond calling out from the kitchen or studio or coming to stand in the doorway of the bedroom, he may say, looks about the same as it did yesterday, or dreams are supposed to be strange. For the past few days though, it has been the same answer. Oh, it's hard to get a hold of anyone in New York this time of year. He's probably closed up the gallery and gone on vacation. When he reads at the solitary hour, there is a calmness around him, a suspension of time. The pain in his lower gut lifts, contentment appeases him. It is only when he moves his position or maybe reaches out to refill the coffee cup that his eye will be caught by the light. He will notice then the latest stain left by the sun on the surface of the room. Each time he happens to look up, the shape of the stain will have changed the intensity of light will be altered from the first chrome yellow stripe on the floor to the last wedge of white through the open door. And he will be aware once again that the axis is turning, that even at this hour of the morning, the day is already moving towards death. He recalls Harry Sterner, a reformed drunk who used to drop by his father's store from time to time. The only thing he missed about being a drunk Harry liked to say, was the suspension of time. A whole day would stop so long as he was prepared to walk into a bar and surrender himself to the bottle. He has experienced this feeling himself from time to time, not through booze, but through work. Some paintings more than others, some paintings not at all. But for him, it has always come in short spurts, the peace dissipating, the moment he steps away from the canvas. Apart from that one summer, the summer of endless rain, when he decided to accept defeat, give up looking for a subject and put away his brushes. 
He took to working on the house instead, building things, the bench, the lawn chairs. He mended window frames and shingles, painted the exterior walls. He fixed and replaced whatever needed fixing or replacing. The pleasure of straightforward work, work that had felt sure in his hands, the ending already in sight before he had even started. And the knowledge too that the outcome could only be an improvement. He surrendered himself to each task. The days disappeared, time suspended. The best months of his married life the most peaceful anyhow. I should have been a carpenter, he had said to himself more than once that summer. I should have been Joseph instead of the guy on the cross. At the start of the summer, he was reading only Montaigne, the old copy that used to belong to his father. He has given up on that now. No matter that he misses Montaigne as he would miss a dear friend, no matter that his essays have always had a settling effect, how many times in the past has he found himself nailing down an idea for a picture after an hour spent in his company? He would like to open the essays right now, remind himself of what the little nobleman had to say on the subject of time. But he is afraid it will set him thinking about his father again. At first he thought it was the essays that were making him feel this way, written as they were out of grief for Montaigne's dead father. But he soon came to realise that it was the book itself, his father's name narrowly inscribed on the flyleaf in ink now rusted with age. All he had to do was hold the book in his hands and after a moment everything would darken. He will be pulled down by regret for the life his father did and did not have. Phrases of pity and pain passing through his head for the rest of the day. Poor pops, poor old dad. Poor father, poor lonely man furtively weeding Montaigne under the counter like a schoolboy who is too clever for his teacher. His father dead almost 37 years and mostly forgotten until this summer, this particular rereading of Montaigne. Now it seems that every time he closes his eyes, he is waiting. He is not sure why this should be, fear of his own death maybe but always he imagines him in the store in Nyack, never at home and never out of doors. Six days a week behind the long counter, late nights catching up with paperwork. He sees him standing there dwarfed by bolts of cloth and pull out drawers stacked like mahogany bricks into the wall. Or he sees him walking through the store between the long polished counters, knick-knack baskets laid out on top and the boxes of gloves that had frightened him as a small boy. Skins from amputated hands, a delivery boy once had told him. Everything about his father was modest. His walk, the back of his head, his small low hung ears. And he remembers a day when he was six years old, catching his father push the boat over the door and turn the sorry we're closed sign to the street, even though it was only 4.30 in the afternoon. And then watching him come back into the dim brown air, his head breaking through the single shaft of sunlight that had been rolling down from an upper window. And how surprised he'd been to see this, his father's head break and scatter the gold speck dust. And thinking even then, at only six years old, how unusual it was to see his father disturb anything at all. Mrs. Watson rapping on the door outside, then clicking angrily on the window with the coin, and he closing his eyes as he hurried past the amputated hands, running into the back office. Mrs. Watson's outside, Pops. Can't you hear her outside banging to be let in? His father lifting a shushing finger to his lips before returning to his copy of the essays hidden in the folds of a large commercial ledger while out on the street, Mrs. Watson continued to bang and click and almost knock the door down. He is eight years older than his father was when he became a dear departed. He has passed his father out. He was young to die. He should have gone on a little longer, worked a lot less, enjoyed his life a lot more, stretched out with his son on his face, reading Montaigne in broad daylight. 
and now the Verlaine has gone missing. A few days ago, he had an inclination to read La Lune Blanche again in the original and went looking for the book in the basement. He searched one box after another, but couldn't find it anywhere. He had been and is certain still that he had slipped it into the green box the evening he came back from East Ham when his wife had caught him off guard. He had shoved it down between Elliot's essays and a bunch of old copies of Life magazine. It had been foolish to hide it from her. It had been inviting suspicion. But he hadn't wanted her sticking her oar into his little moment of nostalgia. Nor did he want her reading the inscription, saying the name in a derisive way or being sarcastic about words that were once so dear to him. He emptied the boxes out and went through the books one by one. But the Verlaine was absent. He did not and will not ask her if she has seen or taken it, even if he knows she has done both. Let her cherish her jealous intrigues. The book will reappear when she finds something new to carp about. And so he is down to the last Frenchman in the house, the journals of André Guide. He found it in a bookstore on 4th Avenue, in the second-hand section, even though it looked as if it had never had a hand laid on it. He likes going to the store to browse or buy, but only when his wife is not with him. The woman in charge is herself a walking library. If a book is not in the store, it's on a little shelf inside her head. She is also a Francophile. He enjoys talking to her about books, about France, about anything really, and knows that if his wife were with him, he probably wouldn't get a word in. The bookstore woman spent two years in Paris, round about the time he was first there. Although, of course, they never met. On a occasion, they have slipped into speaking French in a jocular fashion, the way non-native speakers tend to do. She had always seemed to him to be the easy-going, broad-minded sort. But she showed her teeth when he brought this book to the counter and asked her if she was familiar with Guida. No, she said, and nor will I ever be. If he ever came in the store, I would throw him right out that door. He was both shocked and amused by her attitude, the bitterness of the word she spat out. French thug, Peterist, a man of violence and deviance, a disgrace to the title of Nobel laureate. He turns another page and smiles to himself. Who would have thought he would have gotten along so well? with that type of man. He hears his wife get out of bed, the pat of her feet across the bedroom floor and out onto the bathroom. She calls his name. He doesn't reply. Just this page, he thinks, just till I get to the end of this page, this last drop of coffee. And now the background movement of water, a trickle followed by a robust flush, a few feeble splashes as she washes her hands and then the pat of her feet again. Just to the end of the paragraph, he thinks, let me just finish this paragraph. And now she is calling out to him something about flowers and something about the weather. And this is followed by a long, tutting complaint about the hordes of invaders choking up the streets of Provincetown. Another few seconds, he thinks, just another few seconds in Marseille with this man who doesn't mind cutting himself with a blade of his own honesty. But she is back to the flowers again. And so once you've collected them, then you could. I'll just be a minute, he calls, hoping she will wait there and find something else to do. But she does not wait. Her voice, nearer now, says flowers. Over the frontier of the printed page, he sees her shape caught in the shadow of the doorway. Thank you very much.